Hello, I'm Cliff Serentine. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Wildwood Ways, Edible and Medicinal Treasures. Well, it has been cool and windy and rainy since yesterday, and it's supposed to be cool, windy and rainy for the next couple of days here in the hollow. So I imagine that this is going to be an episode I'm going to have to shoot in several parts, places and times. It's quite interesting, the weather pattern here because the rest of Nova Scotia has been blighted by hot weather and drought for the last month. In fact, just a couple of days ago, I heard that the southwestern half of the province was beginning to lose crops due to the dry weather. And yet up here for several weeks, we've had very consistent weather of a day of hot sun, a day of cloudy, cool weather with the breeze, and then a day of rain. Now, part of the reason that we get so much moisture is we're up at one of the highest points that you can get in Nova Scotia. And at this altitude, while it's not all that high, when the clouds are heavy with rain, they tend to pass right through us rather than over us, and that keeps the land constantly wet. It's been very useful for the gardening season, and in fact we expect our strawberry beds to yield record harvests. In today's episode, we're going to study the forage to be found in back roads and waste places. I'm on the dirt road that runs just north of the cottage, and I've only just stepped onto the road, and I've already come across a great deal of forage. One doesn't have to look far in July. But the plant we're looking at right here is not forage. This is one that every forager must be very careful to avoid because it's quite toxic. It hasn't gone to flower yet. This is tansy ragwort. This particular plant has a knack for resembling some of the growth in the lettuce family, the dandelion, or even the wild radish, but it's not. Now there's some more mature tansy ragwort and maybe we'll get some film of that when we go. Take a look at the distinctive features of this plant, however. The deeply loathed leaves are what cause this plant to look especially like wild radish. However, at the ends of the petioles of wild radish, the leaf tends to fan out in one solid piece, something like a plate. Whereas with the tansy ragwort, the deep lobes go all the way to the end. This plant is, in my opinion, one of the trickier poisonous plants. Because in general, when a plant is poisonous, it tastes poisonous. It tastes like you should not eat it. But tansy ragwort doesn't taste bad at all. I have sampled it, spit it out promptly, and washed my mouth out several times with the water. But I have sampled it to see what it was like. And its taste is neutral and vegetative. It has a bit of an odor of radish to it, just a bit. But enough so that if you really wanted to think it was wild radish, you could easily deceive yourself into doing so. This is one that the new forager must avoid. This is a plant that can kill you if you eat much of it, and it wouldn't take much. We just stumbled upon a grouse with her covey of little ones, and they all scattered every which way. And that cry that you're hearing from the tree just over there is her calling the little ones back to her. This is an especially useful plant that one often comes across at roadsides and in waste places. This is sweet clover. Sweet clover is a relatively large plant. And this one here is just over three feet tall, maybe three and a half feet. It's an easily distinguished plant because it begins as a cluster of stems that tend to grow out of the same common area most likely out of the same rootstock. I'm not sure if this one may clone itself as well. And though this plant bears the name sweet clover, it's not actually a clover at all. The stems are reddish near the base, and as they ascend up the plant, they become a yellow green. We're past the blossom season, so I can't show you the blossoms, but sweet clover tends to come in two forms, those with yellow blossoms and those with white blossoms. And the clover blossoms have the keel, wing, and sail form of any other blossoms of plants from the pea family. It bears the name clover because the leaves are in three-part leaflets and the leaflets are oval and somewhat resemble the shape of the more common meadow clovers. With a sweet clover, the leaves have the additional distinguishing trait that they seem to be outlined in a bright yellow green and they're also slightly toothed. The teeth feel rough, but they're not bristly or spiny. The underside of the leaves is smooth and much paler than the upper side. One of the most distinguishing characteristics of the sweet clover is the vanilla-like smell that comes from the leaves. In fact, you can confirm the identity of this plant by grabbing a raceme and crushing it in your hands. 
and then drop the leaves and give your hand a moment to dry. But after your hand dries, that green vegetative smell will dissipate and what will be left is a sweet scented vanilla fragrance. And that's where the sweet clover gets its name, from that sweet scent. That vanilla flavor makes the sweet clover useful for tea. It's a mild vanilla. Don't ever think you're going to make really potent vanilla flavored pastries with it. It's a mild vanilla, but you can use it to make uh, vanilla flavored teas and to add a bit of a vanilla flavor to dishes you're making. Just dry the leaves and sprinkle them onto whatever dish or dessert it is that you're trying to make. The plant is also edible. As with most flowering plants, you want to eat the green parts before it goes to blossom. That's when it'll be tenderest and easiest to digest. Though at this point, you could still probably make it fairly digestible by cooking it greatly and then adding it in moderation to stir fries with a number of other vegetables. Because of its versatility and that unique vanilla fragrance, sweet clover is one of my favorite wild forageables, especially as an ingredient in teas. If you really want to try something nice, pick a number of wild strawberry leaves and some sweet clover leaves and brew up a nice pot of tea and add a little honey. And as if nature wanted you to make that very tea, right beneath the sweet clover is a small bunch of wild strawberry. I guess it's destined I make some tonight. Now, not a yard away from the tansy ragwort, we've come across one of my favorite forageables. This is the bladder campion. Now, this plant is a lovely edible. The blossoms taste nice, the leaves taste nice, the stems are a little tough, but they can be eaten as well. Everything above the ground with this plant can be eaten. And right up to the end of its life cycle, the leaves are tender and tasty. The leaves and blossoms of this plant can be added to salads. And they're especially good in soups and stews. In particular, I like to harvest a handful of these plants, strip the leaves, and bring them back to the homestead. And Daphne might throw them in venison stew or vegetable soup that she's making. It's a wild forageable that one can hardly go wrong with. It's fairly easy to identify. It has green lanceolate leaves with a semi-pronounced white vein right down the middle. The leaves are opposite up and down the stem. See how they grow in pairs opposite one another? The blossoms are distinctive with their reddish brown bulbs. And coming around to the front, you can see numerous white petals. The flavor is neutral vegetative without any bitterness at any time. So some of you may know, I wrote a rather scathing review of a foraging book recently. It's one of those books that was written in the style of so many that followed the expert work of Ewell Gibbon stalking the wild asparagus. This is one of those books that was written by foragers that really didn't understand what they were doing recommended a number of risky plants. The book was filled with warnings not to go by the material written in the book and that persons that eat the plants that they recommended have suffered poisonings. It was useless. I'm an avid believer that you should only learn foraging from foragers who actually eat or use what they harvest. So to demonstrate that the bladder campion is not only edible but it's quite good, I'm going to have one now. And honestly, well, you know what? I'm going to spit that one out because I forgot to look underneath and make sure there were no bugs under it. And we, this is the time of the year that we get lots of little aphids and spit bugs and such on the leaves, so they should always be checked. But there's another one, free and clear of problems. And yes, they're lovely. You can't go wrong with the bladder campaign. You really can't. I've been seeing in some foraging forums people posting images of these seed pods and asking what they are. Unfortunately, when people post such images, they rarely ever post images of the entire plant, which is essential usually in the identification of any plant or mushroom. These plants here, you may notice, have the distinct, roughly hand-sized circles of lanceolate leaves. Some of you might recognize this plant offhand because it's common along roadsides in Nova Scotia. Also, it's, it's expanded out into meadows and disturbed ground and waste places. These are the seeds of the lupin. 
and I hope lots of you see this video because these seeds are large somewhat pea like in appearance and therefore sometimes people make the mistake of thinking they can eat them this would be a deadly mistake lupin seeds are very toxic you must not eat them many plants in the pea family and many things that look like peas are poisonous anywhere from mildly poisonous to extremely toxic in fact unfortunately these plants occasionally kill children who mistake the pods for peas they're easily distinguished the pods are very hairy they have the brownish papery scale between them and the pods have a distinct black line on the upturned side it appears on the underside as well but much less distinctly it's somewhat faded and they grow on a single stalk from the lupin plant and the stalk is hollow and most distinctively the lupin plant has these palm sized circles of groups of lanceolate leaves that are heavily veined down the middle and feel somewhat scaly underneath right here we have the beautiful blue hues of the vipers bugles this is an easily identified plant that may have some useful value though honestly you should reserve it for a survival situation it's not an ideal plant the vipers bugles has a thick fleshy stem narrow up top getting quite thick toward the bottom it's as narrow as a quarter inch up top and as much as two-thirds of an inch toward the base and they grow pretty tall these are about four and a half feet they have these unmistakable beautiful blossoms There are two blossoms per raceme, and the racemes, which are the extensions of blossoms sometimes grow out on, are about an inch long. The blossoms themselves are an unusual, beautiful hue. One might call it blue, though in truth, it's closer to cyan. And the stamens within are more of a magenta hue, and they have bright yellow tips. The stem has reddish dots all up and down it and it has a bristly hair all up and down it now in that foraging book that I was telling you about it stated that the leaves were edible here's the problem with the leaves the underside of the leaves have a spiny coating it's not very hard these spines wouldn't stick you or hurt you and probably if they were steamed they would wilt right down and not become a problem and not be a problem for when you're eating them but the spines are still there and it leaves me greatly in doubt just how much of the vipers bugles a person should eat I'm not sure honestly if these spines could become an irritant inside somebody's mouth or digestive tract so I'd be very careful with these I'm going to start by sampling these in small quantity I don't know any reports that the stems themselves are edible, nor the roots underneath. I've just sampled the bugless leaf, and the flavor is pleasant, neutral and vegetative, dry. It's not substantial. It's certainly not something would, someone would consider an ideal edible. But it's probably edible. Now, the way one tests a plant that's not likely to have toxicity is to put a bit of it on the tongue take it off leave it off for an hour or two and see if there's any numbness tingling or anything such as that that develops on the tongue if that doesn't happen then you can take a slightly larger dose of the plant just a tiny bite and see if you develop any nausea any kind of reaction to it if that doesn't happen within a day or two then you can have a slightly larger bite and so on you try that until you've had a whole leaf at the end of several days and if that still doesn't become a problem for you then at the end of several days you can try a bit more of the plant a few leaves a, a few leaves on the side of a meal that sort of thing and you keep adding on a little bit this is not a perfect way to determine if any plant is edible the groundsel for example has a strong resemblance to dandelion leaves and even a superficial resemblance to dandelion flowers when it goes into bloom and eating a little of it 
wouldn't hurt you and you would probably think you're okay but it has an alkaloid toxin that will that will settle into your liver and stay there for several weeks and if you keep eating more and more of it over several weeks you'll eventually reach a point where you have a toxic reaction It'll certainly make you quite sick possibly even be fatal so you have to be very careful so I've nibbled on this and I do notice already I'm feeling a bit of scratchiness and irritation on the left side of my tongue where I chew the leaf and then spit it out so I'm gonna wait for a couple of hours and then I'll pass by here again if everything seems a-okay or I don't get anything more than a tiny irritation, I might even venture so far as to swallow a tiny piece of it. But I am dubious about the edibility of this plant and certainly want to confirm it in several other resources before I accept this plant as being edible. This is one of my favorite forageables. It makes a wonderful tea. This particular forageable is sometimes called wild chamomile. It's not a true chamomile. True chamomile is a lovely plant in the aster family that looks a lot like oxide daisy. But this plant has a distinctive chamomile scent. Its scent is also sometimes likened to a pineapple, hence it has another name, the pineapple weed. To identify this plant, merely look for the thin fern-like leaf structure with various flowering stalks. The flowers do not have petals. They're shaped like cones of a greenish yellow hue. If you use some imagination, the blossoms themselves may look a bit like pineapples. That might be another part of why it has that, the alternative name of the pineapple plant. It's those blossom heads that you want. You can collect those and throw them in a cup of water. You'll need to put them in a tea ball or a tea strainer or a bit of thin paper to hold them because as they steep they will separate and be as fine as sawdust in your tea water but the tea they make is absolutely wonderful and it tastes just like real chamomile you might be able to hear the screeching coming from that tree just up over there it was right behind me as I was filming the wild pineapple and doubtless the cries of the red-tailed hawk are coming through just to my left that's one of the parents the screeching is that of a young red-tailed hawk in its nest up at the top of one of those evergreens over there. I discovered it several months ago by accident when my daughter and I were camping here. This is almost on top of base one, our primary camp and teaching site. And every time I walk by here, its parents decide to raise a ruckus and occasionally will do some fake dives at us trying to spook us away. Now, I'm not going to linger here long because I don't want to spook the parents and stress the animals. But a young red-tailed hawk and its parents it is a lovely and interesting thing to see, and I thought you might appreciate it as well. This is groundsel, and it's one the forager needs to be especially careful of. It's often confused when it gets a little more mature and the leaves bigger. This one here is only about six inches in diameter. It's rather small yet. It can easily be identified by its pronounced petioles right down the center of the leaf and the thin lobes that go off a little like small grasping tentacles to either side of the leaf. Groundsel is somewhat poisonous, not extremely so, and you'd have to eat a good bit of it before it actually had a serious negative impact on you. But it's one the forager has to be especially careful of because it's confused often enough with wild lettuces and dandelions, and it takes several weeks for the poison to vacate. So you can eat a little here and there, the poison will slowly build up, and then one day you discover that you've eaten too much when you're quite ill. I'm not aware of any cases of groundsel killing humans, but I'm sure if you had enough of it, it could well do so. Here we have ground raspberry. It's a lot like regular raspberry. It has leaves that grow in three-part leaflets along these red vines on the ground. And here's one of the berries. These berries have been popular with local voles or mice or squirrels because they're mostly picked off. I was lucky to find this one. They taste very similar to any other raspberry, and you would use them the same. However, at least in these parts, you won't find a whole lot of them. So these are one of those plants that when you find them, you might just want to pick them and eat them fresh. As always with wild raspberries and blackberries, cloudberries and such, check the berries to make sure they're free of vermin. One identifies the ground raspberry in much the same way one would identify the leaves of any other raspberry. The leaves are in three leaflets. Each leaflet is heavily veined and heavily toothed. That you'll find large leaves and small leaves all mixed up together. 
And rather than growing on woody canes that rise up out of the ground, the ground raspberry is different primarily in that its stems follow the ground much like vines. Growing here in proximity to the ground raspberry are the roughly heart-shaped leaves of colt's foot. Colt's foot likes to grow low to the ground and it too is a plant of many uses. These leaves can be harvested and burned to ash and the ash can be used as a salt substitute. The leaves themselves can be harvested when they're young and tender and green and cut fine and used as a cook green. They're somewhat mucilaginous in texture and that mucilaginous texture allows them another use. They've been known among many cultures over a great deal of time as an excellent treatment for cough and in my experience they work quite well. Take the leaves, crush them into a pulp, mix them with honey, add elderberry juice to fight the infection, add a strong tea made from the bark of willow. That's one of the best natural treatments for a cold with a cough or a fever that I know. Of course an even better natural treatment is to drink a daily tea made from reishi or chaga or one of the Ganoderma mushrooms. The abundant antimicrobials and antivirals in those fungi do wonders to fight off infection. I've been drinking chaga, ganoderma, and reishi tea for many years and have not had so much as the common cold in all that time. Identifying colt's foot is fairly simple. It's a low growing plant. You never see it more than a foot off the ground. The leaves are attached to these long petioles that grow directly out of the ground. These leaves are fairly small, barely four or five inches in diameter but I've seen leaves as much as six inches in diameter and seven or eight inches long. They're pretty much always heart-shaped and quite distinctive. They're quite green. The leaves themselves have a thick tooth nature. It's, they're not actually tooth. It's more that they come to points wherever the veins reach the end of the leaf and in between. Here we have a lovely yellow flower that's fairly common all over Nova Scotia. It runs down a thin flexible stem and it has these unusual, deeply lobed leaves that seem to fan out in every direction. It's underneath the colt's foot leaf there. All buttercups are poisonous to some degree or another. Most buttercups will make you sick pretty quickly if you eat them. They could certainly be deadly if you ate enough of them. And they're an irritant. If you rub the sap on your skin, they can cause a rash or agitation. Buttercup is one you want to avoid. You can handle them safely. Don't, don't be afraid to pick them for flowers or anything. You just wouldn't want to squeeze the juice, get it all over you. They're not that agitating unless you have an allergy. But you certainly wouldn't want to eat this one. And you wouldn't want to try to do anything with its juice or even make a tea of it. Buttercup is one to be watchful for, especially in these parts where it's very common. Oh, and right over there, I see a big plump ground raspberry. And I'm going to shut off the camera and go enjoy that one now. This is an excellent forageable that everybody who forages should be aware of. This is the burdock plant. It has fuzzy leaves that on the top are somewhat arrowhead shaped and near the base become more heart shaped. It has a thick hollow stalk and its leaves somewhat resemble rhubarb but it has a hollow petiole, whereas the petiole of rhubarb is solid. The taste of the burdock is intensely bitter. Everything up top, the stalk, the leaves, the petioles are intensely bitter. Some writers have written that burdock is an edible vegetable and you can boil the leaves and petioles a couple of times and drain the water to make the bitterness go away. I'd challenge somebody to do that in real life. I've tried and I still find it to be unbearably bitter. However, what you want with the burdock is the large tuber-like root underneath. Depends on how old the burdock is, how big it is. This is a fairly small burdock. It's, it's only about a foot and a quarter tall. I've seen burdock plants three feet and four feet tall. When burdock gets really large, it can have enormous tubers that could fill your arms. The tuber is starchy and it can be cleaned up, steamed, boiled or baked and then the starch can be mashed out of it. It's somewhat potato-like and it makes for excellent eating. 
It's a lot of work to get at it, but it's really good. And when you want that tuber is in autumn, after the burdock plant has had a chance to store all of its energy for the season. The best tubers are those that come from burdock that haven't gone to seed. Those tubers won't be the largest, but they'll be the tenderest. And there's nothing in autumn like what I think of as a huntsman's meal, which is a meal of wild grouse or pheasant, hare or venison, with some burdock tuber on the side, lots of gravy and wild greens, and a nice cold mug of ale that you've brewed yourself. As we get toward autumn and burdock comes the end of its maturation cycle and those tubers are ready to harvest, we'll do a video where we actually dig one out of the ground. It'll be just a burdock video. We'll dig one out of the ground and roast it and I'll show you what a wonderful vegetable it can be. Burdock is also known to have a number of medicinal uses, in particular the burrs, the prickly parts up top that like to get caught in animal fur, just as they're going into bloom and naturally are cracking open, they can be harvested and dried, and a tea can be made out of them, and it's very good for the blood. Right here we have wild strawberry. Wild strawberry is abundant throughout much of eastern North America, especially here in Nova Scotia. It grows everywhere. There's no strawberries, there's strawberry blossoms on these, but that's okay, because what you want from these are the leaves. You can always tell strawberry. It grows from the ground. Tripartite leaves, made of three leaflets, Two of the leaflets in back are opposite each other, and they're smaller than the large leaflet going forward. The back half of the leaves are relatively smooth, and the front half is heavily toothed, and the leaves have a central vein running down each leaflet, and they're rippled. The leaves can be picked, crushed, and used fresh to make a lovely tea, and they can be dried as well. Thank you for having joined me for another episode of Wildwood Ways, Edible and Medicinal Treasures. Next week, we'll take a look at the forage to be found around barns, farms, and gardens. Until next time, go soft, go gently, and leave no trace. Let's go home, boy. <laughs> <laughs>